Good to go. Okay, it's 12 o'clock. It's hard to tell because I'm on my phone and the screen's really small. Hey, everybody. I hear someone. Oh, Chris joined. All right. So, hi, gang. I am Tim Butler, and we are here at Quality Letterpress, uh, going over the joys of letterpress for everybody for Design Week. Um, so let me uh, really quickly tell you a bit about the shop and myself. Um, I uh, started letterpress printing many years ago, right out of high school. And um, it was always a trade that uh, was been very good to me. I've been able to travel the country and work in a lot of different places with a lot of different creative people. Uh, I started the shop about 15 years ago. Um, initially started as a trade shop, uh, which means basically doing work for other people. Um, luckily connected with the design community here in San Diego. Um, Zach Nielsen from Cezio, Mark Hedges, Rosemary Ray, uh, Sean Kelly. And um, due to the fact that I had a large collection of type images, as well as the old machines, we were able to collaborate on a lot of pieces that weren't necessarily for other shops, which has been very beneficial. And as I said, it allowed me to work with a lot of different creative people. Um, over the years, the shop has grown, it's moved, um, presses have come and gone, but uh, consistently, um, San Diego has just been a really good environment for me design-wise and uh, with the creative pool here in San Diego, it's um, always been quite a challenge, which is nice. So thanks for joining and I hope I can be informative and hopefully we can get to everyone's questions or at least most of them. So I'm going to do a little quick shop tour, uh, make the rounds. Let me flip my camera around real quick and uh, we'll get going. Okay, so this is the shop. Currently uh, in this edge of the shop, I am restoring a old show card proofing press. This is uh, mainly used to make signage and other large format pieces. So I'll be digging back into the wood type and images as I get this moving. You can see all these type cases are original. Some date back to the 40s, 50s. Um, I have a pretty extensive wood type collection uh, as well as lead type collection. Um, some small and as you can see, some big. Um, all these cases are currently full, either with handset wood type or images. This is the first Heidelberg windmill, and this press is from 1949. It's a workhorse. You'll see these presses in almost all uh, print shops. Um, it was kind of ubiquitous because it does so much. It will print, number, die cut, score, uh, and registers very well. This one here is an old press, once again, that needs restoring. That is from 1895. But as you can probably imagine, it's a little hard to uh, get parts for everything. Another large type case full of images. The good old paper cutter. In this corner, we have the Chandler and Price hand press. Uh, this press was uh, mainly used for broadsides and printing in the Old West, run by hand. This press is about 100 years old. Um, it's currently set up for die cutting, but we'll be doing a little demonstration on that one a little bit later. Uh, lead saw. This is my Kluge printing press. Uh, this is my foil press. Uh, currently, it's set up for perforating, but uh, generally, this will do large format die cutting, scoring, perforating, and um, all the foil that comes through the shop. This press can be run by hand or automatically. Usually with the foil, it's all done by hand. Um, with this long perfing job that I have, 15,000 sheets, it will run automatically for days and days and days. Uh, the ink cabinet, and then the other Heidelberg windmill. This one is a little bit newer, 1950. 
Um, but as I said, these are really workhorse presses. And as long as you can keep them maintained and in good working order, they register very well. So, okay, there's the print shop. There's Mark. Mark hedges everybody. He's spotting me today and helping out. Uh, Mark's also involved with Design Week through uh, the AIGA. And he's just a good dude. And we've worked a lot over the years. So, hey, look, I'm back. Okay. So, um, as I said, because uh, we do all the different processes that Letterpress covers here in the shop, um, most of the work from designers comes in as a computer file. While some people still like to do the handset type, especially with the vintage images, um, there are certain restrictions. You, it's a lot harder to use different typefaces. Um, unfortunately, some of these uh, typefaces are so old, uh, they're missing a lot of letters and images, and you're restricted. So if you look through a cabinet and find a certain image, but you want it larger or smaller, um, the, uh, you're restricted by the size. So a lot of people will scan them. I'll do proofs. They'll scan them, get them into the computer and resize them, or they'll just do what they can and adjust the design. The difference being with a computer file, we can do anything with hand setting. It's a restriction, but you get a better look, especially with the wood type. A good example would be a piece like this comes to me as a computer file. I'll get black ink or black PDFs separated out. So I don't know if you can see, but there's a sparkle gold foil and a two color print. So it's especially difficult because of the knockouts between the foil and the ink. So this, while on a digital machine or printer would go through one time, with the letterpress, we have to go every pass individually, a lot of it by hand, and it has to register perfectly for all the type knockouts, et cetera. So we'll break it down into a foil plate first, which is a magnesium plate because foil is basically an iron-on, so it's a heat and pressure transfer. So the magnesium or copper dye allows the image to heat up and transfer the foil. After we've done the foil, we put the ink in, and that comes a polymer plate. So basically, it's just hard plastic, once again, of the computer file, and then we hit foil, ink, ink, and then again on the back, we did a full color print as well. So for a thousand pieces, this is going through the press four to 5,000 times, registering every single one. This was a design I did with uh, Judy at Jordan Inc. And uh, once again, with the designers that I work with, it's a little bit different for prepping files for letterpress as other print uh, methods. So we don't use CMYK here. We don't use hex colors. It's all PMS. Um, paper color will change the ink color sometimes. But I've worked enough with Judy at Jordan Inc. that we have the relationship that we can put things together, narrow down the time and the cost to get the client what they want, as well as the most out of the design at the same time. Okay, Mark, let's do a little test, okay? So, okay, we're gonna flip it around and I'm gonna um, demonstrate a little bit of how the press works. So let me unplug this, flip the camera, take it away, Mark. Okay, so this is the Heidelberg I was telling you about. The reason they call this press a windmill is because of the way it rotates. Down here, we have the type to set up in the chase with furniture, once again, by hand. So what happens is the press will turn around. And the sheet goes through the press one by one. I did the black last night. We're adding the red handset type inside of it today. So these will be a coaster. So what I'll do is I'll do the black, then the red, then I'll come over here.
to the hand press. It's old, so it runs a bit slowly. And then this is set up with a steel rule sharpened cutting die. Then I'll hit it, and then we've got a round coaster. Generally, when you die cut, the die cut will be the last method that you do for the finished part of the job. It usually goes foil and ink, then a die cut or a score. You always want to get as much of the printing done before the finishing work as you can. It keeps registration and it allows you to keep control over the overall design and quality of the print front to back. This press, as I said, is the foil press, but it's set up for die cutting. I'm going to turn this one on for a minute. Hopefully it's not too loud. So this is called a clamshell press. The exact same method as the other one. And so what this press is currently doing is, believe it or not, it's making fake license plates. So I get a pallet of blank paper, then I add the perforation and punch the small holes out. And it becomes a fake license plate for the DMV. So if you bought a new car in the last year, you probably have one of these on your car, which is good work. Okay, let's put it back up and we'll keep going. I think we're good on that. No, no, should we do questions? It's only 15 minutes, let's see. I'm just debating. Okay, let's just show you a few more samples of uh, what we do. A lot of my work is wedding invitations. Not currently, but I have built a bit of a reputation of kind of taking on difficult jobs for people, the stuff that people say they can't do. While there are other shops, really good operators, pressmen, and people that own shops that do the letterpress, I've kind of carved a niche with the collection of old type and images that I make available to designers. I'm also kind of known for somewhat for taking crazy requests and trying to get things done. For instance, this is a wedding invitation I did that is on quarter inch thick black acrylic. The thing with these presses is that you can adjust them pretty dramatically to get the thickness of the papers that you want. Here's another one that is handmade paper. Uh, very popular um, handmade paper. Uh, it's tough to keep straight due to the deckled edge, but you can see even foil stamping will work on um, that. This is a large format print I did for uh, Tom DeLong, the Blink-182 guy. He wrote a book, um, the UFO thing, and this is the cover of that book. They did a limited edition print. When you pre-ordered, you got uh, color. The cool thing about this one is if I'm not sure if you can tell, but it's graduated ink. So what I did was this is a dark blue that fades down into a dark green. So keeping it consistently through while keeping all the screens clean was fairly difficult, but it was fun. He's a super nice guy. Another invitation. This was a two color foil with a large die cut. So once again, you start with the foil, started with the gold, then the uh, pinkish purple color, and then die cut the horse all the way around. Very large, I don't know what it cost them to mail it, but it was all good. So that's what I've kind of done. And what I do is I do make available all the resources in the shop. So a lot of designers will come in. I've proof type for ad agencies where they'll take it back, scan it, 
and then they can manipulate it more in the computer. But more or less, what I do is work from computer files. It allows people to do a lot more intricate designs with typefaces, shapes, colors, stuff like that. Trick is, is that every color you do with letterpress has to have its own print plate and its own press run. So a single color is a lot different than two color versus three color versus four color, front and back, all that stuff. Mark's writing something down. He's giving me notes. Let's see. First question from Susan. What are some of the wood type I have? Well, uh, fortunately, I still have some of my wood type due to the freeze in work. Uh, six months ago, I did have to unfortunately sell off some of my collection to stay open, but I still have a lot of wood Hamilton type, some William Page type, uh, large and small. I've got a full case uh, of type and um, most of them are fairly complete, a lot with punctuation and ligature. Um, but, you know, probably a good 10 or 15 drawers left. I also have a lot of large foundry type. Uh, the type we're using for this is an old foundry type that I found um, in a collection. A lot of people contact me to clean out garages or print shops that are closing down or I get an email that said my grandpa had a print and I don't know what it is, can you value? As I said, it's been really great for me. I've been able to travel. I've gone to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, Massachusetts, a lot of different places. Do you do offset printing? No, I don't do offset printing. The difference between offset printing is, think of it like this. This is a cylinder and this is a cylinder. You have a plate for offset printing that has a relief where the ink will only stay to the offset plate that image gets offset onto a blanket. As the sheet goes through those two cylinders, the ink offsets onto the paper. What I do with letterpress is it's an imprint. Originally, you were never supposed to hit letterpress deep or hard. It was not recommended. I was fortunate to learn from the people that were craftsmen and tradesmen that would go to LA Trade Tech in the 50s and their job was running a lead type typesetting machine or a press until they retired. I was able to get the last end of those gentlemen while they were still working. You were never supposed to hit type hard because type was made of lead and it was soft. And the harder you hit it, the type didn't stay up very well. It didn't keep a good crisp edge. The idea of hitting type hard really came about in the late 90s, I'd say, with the changeover to cold type. A lot of the old presses were getting scrapped. A lot of the high school's graphic arts departments were closing down, so they were scrapping the machines. Along with people making more handmade paper and thicker paper. So those two things combined, designers started buying the presses and they figured that they could hit this harder. Then along comes the fact that you could do a polymer plate or a copper plate, which is a lot stronger and more durable and lasts longer than the lead type, allowed people to start hitting it hard. But when I was starting out, no, no, no. You were not supposed to hit type hard at all. It wrecks your type. Do we have another one? What's the coolest, weirdest job you've done? <laughs> I did a job once. It was for a clothing company. It was a magnetic ink and a mirrored foil. And when you opened the box, it had fingerprint dust, magnetic fingerprint dust and a brush. And you had to brush away the fingerprint dust and that would reveal the text for the invitation. 
that same company did a mirrored foil that when you opened up the box, all the type was reversed and you looked into the mirror to get your invitation. What's the Godzilla story? Uh, my friend, Valentin Viennet, the painter genie, who has a shop down on the bottom of Reynard uh, Latelier. She's a silkscreen artist. I met her years ago. She came in to do a class at my shop because she wanted to buy a press. She spent a four hour class with me and decided there was no way she was gonna buy a letter press because it was too hard. When I moved to this location, she came in with her silk screens and put up uh, Godzilla and I have a giant Jack Nicholson over there and an airplane from North by Northwest on my wall. So I collaborate a lot with Valentine. She has come in and I've proved images for her. She does large silk screen patterns and makes fabrics and coasters and other things. So she's become a good design friend. Do you do all the machine repair? Where do I get parts? I do all the machine repair. Fortunately, um, I was factory trained by a Kluge mechanic and really it comes down to if something breaks, you have to fix it. You don't really have an option. Parts, I have resources kind of all over the country. Uh, NA Graphics in Colorado is a good resource. Letterpress things in Chicopee, Massachusetts. John Barrett is a good friend of mine. Um, all over the country, uh, like any subculture, there's a group of people that support each other. Uh, even locally, if someone's short on foil or needs a job help or whatever, we're all willing to help each other because we are kind of all in this together. And even though they're doing the same type of work I'm doing, we're not necessarily doing the exact same work. You know, shop A doesn't want to do 150 acrylic wedding invitations. They want to do 100,000 boxes. But the community is tight knit, you know, just like the design community is here in town. Everyone has to support each other because that's the way we all get work is by helping each other out. Yes, press repairs are difficult. Some go easy, some are not easy, but patience is a virtue. It's like hand setting type. And you just have to go a little bit at a time and figure it out as you go. And a lot of luck. Do you work with original lino cuts? Yes, I do. I have all these, as I said, all these cabinets with the wood type and line cuts um, I can still use. Years ago, they standardized type high. So type high is 0.918 thousandths of an inch. So the lead type, the wood type, the old images, even when I use the polymer plates, I'll put that on a uh, aluminum base, that gets me up to type high. So I can use lead, images, wood, all at the same time, knowing that some of them are gonna be worn due to age. Some of them are gonna be not as clean of a, of a print. So there's ways to clean them and try and get the most out. Some of them just don't work. Next caller, show the Spider-Man poster. I don't have the Spider-Man poster out. So the story about the Spider-Man poster, thanks Joe. Story about the Spider-Man poster. You're welcome. It, I worked for a designer called the text artist who morphed letters into designs. He got a job through Marvel and Upper Deck and for Comic-Con a couple years ago, we did a limited edition poster, which was a five color 13 by 20 ginormous building with Spider-Man swinging. So I did a certain amount like that, and then a certain amount were registered with foil. So Spider-Man and the lights in the building were all knocked out as foil. I did 400 of them, and it took me about 10 days production to do them right and correctly. But they were happy, and it is a cool poster. Very cool poster. Tracy. 
Well, it's the biggest size I can run. So foil, about 12 by 18. Unfortunately, the large format letter press was sold. That's why I got this proof press. Um, most of the large format letter presses, unless they're cylinder presses and production presses, most of the uh, Vander Cooks, a lot of those presses that you'll see in letter press studios at Hatch and a lot of different places are either hand cranked or automatic. So even though you have a large format, quantity can be difficult because you have to run the sheet one at a time. Right now, that's about 14 by 42, 36. Once again, one by one, takes a little time, but I can still do it. Do you make plates in house? No, I don't make plates in house. Um, I tried to, uh, plate makers are expensive, especially when you get up to the large uh, plate makers. I use a company called Graphic Dice Inc in Santa Fe Springs. They're great people. I've been working with them for 15, 20 years. They're always very helpful. They make foil dies as well as my polymer plates. And for cutting dies, I use San Diego die cutting or coastal die cutting to make my uh, die cutting dies. Anything to keep in mind as a new designer production tips? File prep. File prep is the most important thing. I could tell you gruesome. I asked someone to outline a file for me. I said, can you please save the PDF as outlines? I literally got the outlines back. Let me see the pen mark. And they literally outlined every letter like that. Or I say, can you please add crops to the file? And it's a business card file and they say, well, I don't know how to change my crops to business card size from eight and a half by 11 artboard. It's so incredibly important to get the file prep correct. If you don't start right, it's not gonna be good. You wouldn't start cooking with lousy food or expired food. You have to start with good files. When you knock stuff out, the traps have to be perfect when you run foil uh this job right here foil is heat so it expands so you have to take the expansion rate in when you do the knockout for the ink laying inside of it but file prep file prep file prep it saves money it saves time if you don't outline and give me a black file what happens is is if the die maker or the plate maker doesn't have that font in their system it becomes a, a font substitution and then it comes back and the plate is wrong. Unfortunately, that's not my fault. First thing I tell people is, I don't know how to spell someone's name. I don't know the day they're getting married. I don't know the address where they live. So all that has to be approved before I send the plates off. I can tell you horror stories. I had a Christmas card one time, $4,000 worth of Christmas cards for this big digital company in Burbank and the guy that did the files didn't realize that when they moved their office, their zip code changed. So the whole job had to be run again. And that's a very expensive mistake. You have to be very careful. So first thing I would say is file prep and work with the shop, whoever prints it, that you're dealing with. Ask them questions. It's the best thing you can do. It saves your client time and it saves everybody money more importantly what's this one are you familiar with hamilton wood type printing museum yes i haven't been to the hamilton wood type museum unfortunately i've been close a few times when i was on the road with the band but didn't have enough time to get through uh, another resource on the west coast is the printing museum in carson mark barber has done an excellent job of curating that museum they've got one of the few replica heidelberg Gutenberg or Gutenberg presses. They've got some great old grasshoppers. They've got great volunteers and docents uh, running the inner types. I've worked with Mark a lot on repairs and tracking parts down and stuff. It's a great resource. They do a print fair every year where it's like a swap meet and you can get stuff, print stuff and everything like that. Great resource to check out. What's my favorite paper for letter press? Interesting. 
Cranes is a great paper. 100% cotton, tree free, great texture, works well, gets a good consistent impression, and it's expensive. And it's also the sheet size. I, right now, my kind of stock paper for invitations, uh, which comes in a 118 and a 236, is a Savoy, Reich Savoy. It's much more cost effective and the parent sizes are different. So on a crane sheet for $7, you'll get a 2026 sheet. On the Savoy for a 236 pound, you'll get a 26 by 40 sheet. So you literally double the amount of paper. That's good. The Wild is a really good stock. Um, th just anything that gives a texture and a good impression. Thickness is always a consideration. It really depends on the job. Some papers are better for foil. Crane is not good for foil because of the rough texture. The cotton fibers don't want to stick together, so it's harder to get a good foil image on cranes than it is the Savoy. The paper that I'm using for the coasters, which is a 60-point R-board, is so textured, foil just simply won't stick to it. So kind of job by job, but I, like the, I do like the Savoy. Do you want me to run the press? You're supposed to ask them, babe. Oh, do you want me to run the press? Okay. <laughs> I can run the press. I just know how loud it will be. Um, it's, look, it's all good. The thing with letterpress is literally it's job by job. I have to treat every job individually because there are so many variables with each design group. I've consistently built a client base so that a lot of the wedding designers I work with, we have a set paper. Some of the wedding designers I work with, I don't even see them. They send me files, I put it in the mail or they come by to pick it up, but it's just back and forth and back and forth. Not so much these days. A lot of the trade work is different. M and H still up and running. M and H. Is M and H still up and running? Not sure who M and H is. Maybe that's a lead manufacturer, lead product, lead. Yeah, it could be a foundry. I'm not sure. Um, not sure about that one. The the main thing to remember is, like I said, everybody is going to want a different thing when it comes to letterpress. There's also a lot of good tricks. Die cutting is a great way to make something look fancy. I can show you a five by seven card, but if you die cut it with round edges, it makes it look completely different and gives it a whole different look. So there are different ways to do things. Blind hits, which is just a print plate with a deep impression without ink. So a lot of it depends upon what the client wants and what they want to get out of the design. I'm not a designer. I don't pretend to be a designer. I don't run Photoshop. I don't run Illustrator. I see my role more of as a design editor sometimes. One of the issues I've run into with design firms is they will brand a big company. They do this wonderful design. They go to the company. The company says, we love it. That's exactly what we want. Then they come to me and they say, can you price this out? And I say, well, they don't make that size envelope. You're gonna to have to make them from scratch. That paper won't work for what you want it to do. That paper is $15 a sheet and it's a mill order and it's gonna take three weeks to get here. The best thing you can do is when you're designing something, reach out to your printer first and find those things out so you don't back yourself into a corner with your client. That's a big one. How are, have you grown thrived in this industry? Words of wisdom. That's a tricky one. I think what has allowed me to grow and thrive has been the design community in San Diego. Seriously. I mean, it's been, I've been very fortunate, as I said, with Mark and all the design firms, Hollis, Myers Ball, you know, Fabric, 
a lot of these places have reached out for me and done work with me. Nine Ash, a lot of the big printers, Tony Rush and all these and why while some of them have shrunk or moved or done other things, I'm fortunate because they consistently reach out. It goes back to what I said about we're literally all in this together. Company A and company B might be vying for the same job, but it's a lot easier if we're all supportive because one company thriving also opens up the other company to get the different job. It's really important. So I, I would say really just be supportive of each other and easy. And it just works for everybody a lot better. But I'm really fortunate when I met Zach and Sean Kelly and those people, those guys have really been consistent with me and supportive of the shop. And um, I, I'm really blessed to be able to sleep in every morning, go on the road with the band when I want to and bring my dog to work every day. I mean, I'm really fortunate, even in the climate that we're in, I can still work by myself. I still have trade work and still check in with people and it's all good. There's no more questions. Oh my gosh, guys, we got time to go. Jeez, there's gotta be more people than that. Run some, run some cards. Run some cards, do you want me to run some cards? All right, I'll run some cards. We'll do more die cutting. Yes, all right. Okay, cameraman. All right, grab it. We'll run some more cards and then we'll ask to see if anybody has more Yeah, there you go. And like I said, I'm gonna die cut all these and get them to Mark. So when there's a meetup tonight. Tonight. At Little Italy. Little Italy, downtown. downtown. AIJ is doing a wall graphic pop-up. Come down there between eight and nine o'clock and we'll have these out on the table. Yeah, there you go. Get them while they last. This is the more tedious version of the die cut. This press is basically used for short run ink and small die cuts like this. It runs slow because I have to stick my hand in it and there is no break. So even if I turn it off, it doesn't stop. So you really have to be careful and you have to be very aware um, and just very consistent. Ooh, there's a line hit for you, Mark. There you go. And they just pop right out. And we have coasters. Now all the coasters, you'll notice I'm running on square stock. I run them on square stock because it allows me to register better than I cut. Cuts always last, especially when you have an uneven sheet because you can't keep anything registered straight and even. So I'll set it up so that the circle is in line and then set the red up inside of the circle. When I get down to adjusting, especially with the die cut, I'll show them this real quick. So this is a steel jacket, which allows the cutting roll not to damage the bed of the press. And then I tape wood blocks down to the position of the paper where I want it. 
then to make micro adjustments. These are actually pieces of masking tape. And as I add them, it will adjust by sometimes a point, two points at a time to square it up and get the image to where I want it. It can take with, especially with the wood type, scotch tape makes a difference. A single layer of toilet paper, I use a lot for packing. That much of a difference, as old as this machine is, that much of a difference with packing either behind the type or on the bed of the press can make a huge difference. And that's where people get frustrated with letterpress. It really does take patience. I remember the Mark came in the first time and he wanted to set a line of type and he lasted about 10 minutes. He said, you do it. And it took me about <laughs> two, but it's a practice die and I've been doing it for a long time. But really what it takes to do this is a lot of patience especially going back to the repair question. I had a broken press. It took me three months to have the part manufactured and made. These presses are made to fix, but as you, you know, said, it's hard to get parts. They're old, they're heavy. I moved everything myself. Uh, Mark asked me earlier what was left from when I first opened 15 years ago. This was the first one, the foil press I got in Eugene, Oregon. And the Heidelberg over here, I got in Washington State. Keep in mind, I've moved all these machines myself. So when I say Washington State, I drove a truck to Washington State and loaded it up and drove it back and moved everything myself in the shop. So I've got a connection really to all this equipment. Same with the tables and the cabinets. The table over here, This printing stone came from the Bremerton, Washington newspaper. It's one solid oak cabinet. It weighs about a thousand pounds. And then it's got a one piece cast iron top. The reason they call these printing stones was because when you were hand setting type, you needed a flat surface. Wood will warp, it will ding and it will dent. But with this, when you set your type, it's always going to be flat. That's why they call them printing stones. Uh, this one actually, this type case actually has a marble top. This case full weighs about 2000 pounds. All these drawers are full of handset lead type. Each drawer weighs about 15 to 20 pounds. So there's, I think 48 drawers in here. So as you can imagine, it was a little bit arduous to move. Same with the type cabinets. Um, part of the reason I get this stuff is it's just cool. That's why I have nine guitars, but I hate to see it lost as well. The reason I bought this type cabinet, I don't use any of these images really, except for in classes. And if someone asks for a vintage image or a certain kind of ornament, but that came out of a print shop in San Diego. So I have some great old San Diego images, um, the Jessup Jewelers Clock, the San Diego Consolidated Gas Company, some really old, cool images that I would just hate to see tossed. I mean, like I said, I've been through a lot of presses. Mark knows I've been through a lot of machines in here, back and forth, dialing everything in. But part of it too is the history of it is important to me as well. I would just hate to see all of it lost. When they went to cold type, a lot of it was thrown away and scrapped. Let me see. The San Diego drawer, the Parkway Bowl in El Cajon, um, the bell tower at San Diego State, an old Aztec. So um, a lot of them, I just don't want to disappear. And when I have time, it's cool. I proof them and I, I do different things with them. Uh, but it's really, um, I don't get a lot of use for um, photos of Abraham Lincoln and whoever these guys are. 
but I have uh, old um, half screen photos of Doughboys at Camp Kearney, which is now Miramar, with wagons and pulling cannons getting ready for World War I. Shots of the plank road and S, uh, from El Cajon to Yuma, cars broken down on the plank road. So to me, that's what's cool about it. It's the history. It's what this did, how it was printed, and it would just be a drag to lose the story of doing stuff by hand. I'm a glutton for punishment. Okay, look, we're back. All right, Mark, what'd you do? Okay, there I am. Is that Joe? I think that's Joe. Hey, Joe. Even Joe. Joe's got a press. And Joe knows he can call me and ask me questions. And he's been down in the shop. We worked on quite a few jobs together. I think a lot of people on the, you know, chat thing or clients of mine. And like I said, I'm fortunate to work with cool, creative people. That's one of the bonuses of what I do. It's very helpful. Um, I've done shop tours for the Art Institute, for State, for City College, the AIGA. We've done posters, swag for the Y. Um, well, I did a few demos at the Y with a little tabletop press. So I see doing the classes and stuff like that as educating people to the process. If you know more about the letterpress process, you're going to be more confident in selling that process to your client. I'm not going to tell you that it's cheaper. I'm not going to tell you that it's faster because it's not. But it doesn't take much to make something cool. Splash of foil a double paste, a quick die cut, makes a big difference. Because still in this digital age, a business card is cool. And when you have a cool business card, when you give it to somebody, it still makes a difference in how that people, how you uh, represent yourself to that company or what you're selling or what you do. So business cards are still a big thing for me and it's good, I enjoy business cards. So, flocking, is that like a Christmas tree? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what flocking is either, sorry. Um, but we can get to edge painting. Edge painting is cool. Edge painting works great. It's not easy to do. Some people use a sponge, some people airbrush. There's a lot of different ways to do it. The one thing to keep in mind with an edge paint is that the stock has to be thick. If the stock isn't thick, it just won't work. It won't show up and it's not very cost effective unless the stock is thicker. It's a good way, once again, to make something look cool. I do it a lot on uh, wedding invites and sometimes on business cards. You get another one, Mark? What's this one? Are there modern letter presses? Not really. Unfortunately, no one really manufactures. You can still buy Kluge's big ones, you can still buy big foil presses, big die cutters. Those are still around, but these smaller ones, the hand feed, like a tabletop press or a press that you would put in your garage and just do hobby printing. No, there aren't the small hand feed flywheel presses being manufactured anymore, unfortunately. The market's not bad, you can find them. It's not the cost of the press, as much as moving it because it's heavy and it can be expensive and not hurting yourself when you try to learn how to run it. That's a big one because they bite and they're very easy to break, believe it or not. Tim, is sorry to interrupt. Oh. Uh, Joe knows. Is what, was the company, what was the company that you had me move my, my press with last year? San Diego Machine First. Yeah. They're good, they're local, he's moved all my stuff, he's really good. Um, but you know, I, there have been horror stories. Somebody gets a press on eBay, they get one of those low bid shipping companies. A girl bought one, she had it from Kentucky to uh, LA. The guy got it to her, pre to, to her house, dropped it off the back of the truck, bent the flywheel, and she put up a post saying, can I fix it? And it be, basically became a very expensive paperweight. So it's foil or die cutting costly. 
Not really. The way things are basically priced, basically, <laughs> is by image area, the size of the image area. So a two names on a wedding invite, a foil die isn't that much. A foil die like this, which is nine by 12, is a lot more expensive. So everything's priced by the square inch. As far as I'm concerned, the labor is the same. The cost is between a print plate and a foil die. I would say maybe 20% more costly. Die cutting, not really. The only trick with die cutting is that you have to buy a cutting die. If it's so if it's a specific shape, it's a one-time thing. So a lot of with the wedding designers I use, they'll make a shape, I'll keep that shape on file, then they can continually sell that shape to bride after bride and pay for the die one time. Can't really change a cutting die once it's made. A foil die will print foil and also do a blind hit. A print plate will do ink and a blind hit. But a print plate won't do foil and a foil plate won't do print, basically. Right, Mark? Yes, sir. Where are we? Oh, man. That was pretty quick, huh? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. So I really appreciate everybody hanging out. And I would really like to thank, A, Mark, who's been my spotter today and very helpful, as he always is. Stacy Kelly, who's worked extremely hard and is still working extremely hard. James and Taiki for all the Zoom help. I'm glad we figured this out and pulled it off. I know there are a lot of volunteers working hard, doing the events with Mark and behind the scenes. And I've been getting really great emails and everyone's been really communicative and very helpful. Um, and really all these people that signed in, letterpress is cool. I mean, it really is. Like I said, I'm not gonna tell you it's cheap, I'm not gonna tell you it's fast, but it's a good way to do a finishing piece on your design to step it up and make it look cool. Check with your printer before you go to your client. <laughs> Always a good one. File prep, file prep, file prep. And uh, I really appreciate it. Crossing my fingers, if all goes well, hopefully in October, if you keep checking the website, qualityletterpress.com, I'm gonna try and do classes again. Production's been slow and it may only be one person at a time, but if I can get back to maybe one or two classes a month and get everybody in and it's really cool, you get to pull type, lock it up, talk to me, dig through stuff, learn stuff, run some stuff on the press, it's very cool to do, and you can always printertim at gmail.com, ask me questions. I'm around, not early, but I'm around. Oh, and swag, get the, get the swag tonight. It's actually STD, oh, I can read that right. All right, so I'm reversed. So yeah, swag it out tonight with Mark down Little Italy. Thank you, Stacy and everybody, and um, you guys be safe, be well, wear a mask, all right? Talk to you soon.